Okay, all right. Good morning, everyone. And can everybody hear me well in the back? Okay, let me get this closer. Does this sound better? Great. All right, let's, uh, let's get started. And thank you for the introduction. And today I'm gonna talk about pseudo-randomness in a quantum world, which will echo several of the talks we've heard so far. And this is joint work with my great collaborators, Jungfen Ji from UT Sydney and Yi Kai Liu at NIST and University of Maryland. All right, so let me start off by claiming that randomness is useful, period. So I believe you have already have lot, tons of examples flying in your head supporting this claim, like all the nice randomized algorithms, probabilistic constructions of you know, nice combinatorial objects, and of course, everywhere in cryptography. But everything comes at a cost. You know, true randomness may be, difficult, may be expensive to come by. For example, you find a sample random Boolean function such that every n-bit input gets assigned one bit random output independently, then we're gonna need two to the n fair random coins. And that's an exponentially large number. But most of the time, a good approximation, which we call pseudo-randomness, is as useful, if not more. So pseudo-randomness basically means that we can efficiently sample from some universe such that the sample would just look no different from a sample from, uh, according to some ideally random distribution, typically a uniform distribution over the universe. And for the most part of this talk, we're only be concerned, concerned with efficient observers. Okay, and you've realized this is just the familiar computational indistinguishability. All right, so just a refresher of some important pseudorandom objects. First of all, pseudorandom generator, which is an efficient algorithm G such that it, it expands a relative short random seed K to a long string RK, which is indistinguishable from a uniform random string R. And next, take all the functions with n bit input and output as the universe, then we can consider a set of functions fk indexed by a k k, and we call it pseudo random if, if we pick a random k, then fk will appear just as a function chosen uniform random from the universe, from all functions. Okay, so PRGs and PRFs, they are central primitives in cryptography and that appear all over the places. And there is also a beautiful theory saying, well, PRG and PRFs, they exist if only if one-way functions exist. So far, so good. But the question we're asking this work is, how about a quantum work? What happens? Okay, so one could ask, what if the observer, which is the attacker in this, in this setting here, becomes capable of quantum computing? So are those pseudo-random objects still secure? So this is a very important question that then has received quite a bit of research. And I think it's safe to say that there are pseudo-random generators and pseudo-random functions which we believe to be quantum secure under reasonable assumptions. Okay. But notice that this side of the question only considers the attacker being quantum. But there is another element in this picture which can change in a quantum world. That is the universe, right? We might want to sample from a quantum universe instead of just the classic objects like strings or functions. And that's what we explore in this work towards developing a theory of quantum pseudorandomness. So first of all, we propose a definition of primitive called pseudorandom quantum states which is analogous to pseudorand generators, and we give an efficient construction which uses any quantum secure pseudorand function as a black box. And then we investigate all the nice properties and applications, and most, the most interesting one is, to, is the construction of a private key quantum money from any pseudorand state due to a seemingly stronger but equivalent formulation of pseudorand states and also a non-canoning pro property of pseudorandom states. 
Okay? And finally, we take an initial step for studying pseudorandom unitary operators, which is analogous to pseudorandom functions. So we propose a definition and give several candidate constructions. But unfortunately, we're yet to prove them. OK, so let's get to some real meat. And let me start with, it's, that's hard to see, but let me start with defining pseudorandom states. OK, so first of all, what are quantum states, in case you're not familiar with that? Well, the basic information unit in quantum computing it's called quantum bit or qubit. It's just a vector with length one on a complex plane. Okay? And for multiple qubits, they're composed by the so-called tensor product operator. So the specifics are not important, but it's crucial to keep in mind that dimension grows exponentially with the number of qubits. And this is in sharp contrast with classical strings. Okay? And the ideal distribution for quantum states, it's called, it's called hard random. And a hard random state has been used to test all kinds of physics theories, among other applications. And it's not surprising that it takes exponential many random bits to sample a hard random state. OK, so with this element spelled out, a, a definition of pseudorandomness for quantum states seems at hand, right? So let's consider a collection of quantum states, psi k, indexed by a class called key k. How about we call this psi k pseudorandom if, number one, we can efficiently generate psi k on quantum computer? And number two, the pseudorandom part just supports computational indistinguishability here. We say, OK, I pick a random k and ask that psi k is indistinguishable from a hard random state. Well, unfortunately, this definition doesn't quite make the cut due to a weirdness known as quantum non canoni So basically, it says that given the unknown state psi, it's impossible to produce two identical copies. So what does that imply? Well, think about it. Classically, if I give the observer a copy of the string, well, it's, it will have full knowledge and can make as many copies as, as it wants. But quantum non canonian says, well, we, we cannot presume that in a quantum setting. And in fact, the number of copies we give to the observer really matters. You can come up with a family of states such that if you only give one random copy, it's perfectly indistinguishable from a higher random state. But as long as you give it more than two copies, it's trivial to distinguish them. So instead, the definition we propose, which we think is A, is A right one, we explicitly give the observer multiple copies of the sample, and in fact, any polynomial in many samples, and we ask indistinguishability to hold. <coughs> uh, in this setting, okay, this is what we call a pseudorandom state. All right, next let's see some nice properties and applications which would further justify our definition. So first of all, let's consider a variant, a variant definition where we additionally give the observer access to a reflection oracle which reflects a vector about the given vector. So for any state phi, this R sub phi operator, the reflection operator, will flip the sign of phi, but will keep anything orthogonal to phi unchanged. So uh, we, we require the pseudorandomness, the indistinguishability to hold with respect to this stronger, seemingly stronger observer. So obviously, a, a pseudorandom state in this sense it's automatically a pseudorandom state in the earlier notion. But we also showed the reverse direction. And the reason is, so, so that means the reflection oracle doesn't help the observer to distinguish the two cases. And the basic idea is, when we have multiple copies, we can simulate this reflection oracle. And this also shows allowing multiple copies in our definition is crucial. 
And next, we can show that a pseudo-random state is hard to clone efficiently. And in fact, given several copies of, the, of a pseudo-random state, it's uh, infeasible to produce any surplus. And to show this, we can, we can, we can show that a good copier would give a, a good distinguisher. So let's take 2m plus 1 qubits, OK? And we feed the first m qubits to the hypothetical copier, which would produce m plus 1 copies. And then we run the swap test on the top m plus 1 and the bottom m plus 1 qubits, which, very loosely speaking, will tell us whether the top ones and the bottom ones are identical. So when the input state is a higher random state, it's been proven in the 90s that it cannot be cloned unconditionally. So that means this swap test will say, no, the top ones and the bottom ones are not the same. On the other hand, if there is a good copy here that can copy a pseudorandom state, then the swap test will say yes. And that's how the observer can tell a discrepancy. And an interesting application follows from these two properties, which is it gives us a construction of quantum money. So what is a quantum money? Well, it's a money design where the banknotes can be quantum states. Specifically, let's think about a bank which uses a secret key to produce a banknote, call it dollar $SK. And suppose after some transaction, this banknote goes to another client who submits it to a verifier to, to check if this, um, this note is valid using the verification key VK. So if SK and the VK are the same, we call it a private key quantum money scheme. And here, only the bank can verify the bank note. But if the two keys are asymmetric and VK can be made public, then we call it public key quantum money. And here, anyone with the verification key can check the validity of the banknote. And to make a secure money, obviously, we want to make sure nobody can counterfeit a new banknote. All right? And this should be true, given that the counterfeiter can potentially take advantage of the verification procedure to help him or her. And it's not hard to convince yourself that classically, any banknote can be copied, can be counterfeited in principle, unless we show that any pseudo-random state will give us a private key quantum money scheme almost immediately. So basically, we just let the note, the banknote, dollar SK to be psi K. And by the two properties we just shown, it will imply that psi K will be hard to counterfeit. And here, the reflection oracle will be pretty much the verification procedure. OK? And I want to point out that the idea of creating a uh, quantum money using, by, by means of quantum information that was proposed back in the 60s and was considered the born of quantum cryptography. But getting a secure one has been really an unachievable, and there's a, there's a long history of you know, breaks and fixes. It's not until 2012 that Arison and Chris Daniel, they proposed, they proved the first privilege secure private key money, quantum money based on a specific algebraic assumption. And in, in comparison, our scheme is generic and can be based on any pseudorandom state. And we'll see in a second that can be based on any quantum secure pseudorandom function. Okay? So this will be more versatile and could offer better efficiency and security. All right, let's see how to construct a pseudorandom state. Well, we're going to take a quantum secure pseudorandom function, fk here, and then we're going to create the superposition which superpose over all numbers from 0 to 2 to the n minus 1. And the amplitudes are determined by raising the, the root of unity to the power of fk of x. Okay? And we can show this will be a pseudorandom state. And to see this, well, basically, 
pseudorandomness comes from the fact that if we can just first switch fk to a truly random function because fk, FK is a pseudorandom function. And then we can explicitly calculate the distance, its distance to a hard random state, which is negligibly small. And we can also generate the state psi k efficiently, essentially by quantum Fourier transform. Okay, and we call this construction random phase states, and they are pseudo-random. All right, finally, let me uh, tell you briefly our some preliminary result on pseudo-random unitary operators. Okay, so similar to uh, the classical setting where we use functions to manipulate strings, quantum physics says that the legit operations on quantum states are going to be unitary, which are reversible and length preserving. And simple examples include uh, rotating or changing the phase of a, of a vector. And the ideal distribution here when it comes to unitary operators is also ca called hard random. Think of it as the uniform distribution for unitary operators. And hard random unitaries, they found use in designing quantum algorithms and cryptographic primitives, etc. And again, it's expensive to sample. So instead, we're going to define a pseudorandom unitary operator, which is a collection of unitaries, again, indexed by a class called KEK, such that for a random K, UK will be indistinguishable from a hard random unitary. And more specifically, this sampled unitary is given to the observer as an oracle. Or you can think of it as a basic gate so that you can invoke it in your computation any polynomial times. All right, but how do we construct a pseudorandom unitary? Well, we've come up with several candidates, but unfortunately we haven't been able to prove them. But let me tell you the construction. So we're gonna take a pseudorandom permutation, a quantum secure pseudorandom permutation, which exists assuming a quantum secure pseudorandom function, okay? And then given any n qubit input, we're gonna hit it first by this pseudorandom permutation. And then we're gonna apply a bunch of hardware, which will change the basis of the qubits, and then we repeat this. And we conjecture with enough repetitions, this will be a pseudorandom unitary. And you can think of, you can think of all, uh, various variants of this. For example, instead of doing hardware, you can apply a quantum Fourier transform in between. Okay, so before I conclude my talk, uh, I want to mention an important related work which some of you might be expecting since the very beginning. So we've been treating pseudorandomness as, as a approximation to true randomness as far as efficient observers are concerned, okay? So what if we don't restrict the running time, but rather uh, the number of observations that the observer can, can see? This will give us a statistical notion of pseudorandomness, commonly known as t-wise independence. For example, a statistical version of a pseudorandom function would be a family function such that it's going to be indistinguishable from a true, truly random function as long as the observer only evaluates the function t times. And t is typically a small, a small number, like a constant. Okay? And the statistical pseudorandomness in the quantum setting has been studied quite a bit before. They are known as t designs, both for quantum states and for unitary operators. And I should say many applications have been identified for those T designs. And we anticipate that we can pretty much plug in our computational versions of these pseudorandom objects as long as we are fine with efficient adversaries. All right, okay, let me uh, quickly wrap up. So we've seen a definition of pseudorandom quantum states. And we've seen the construction of pseudorandom states from any quantum secure pseudorandom function. 
and also a private key quantum money scheme following from some nice characteristic, characteristics of our pseudorandom quantum states. And also some preliminary results on pseudorandom unity operators. So we believe there are lots of new directions to explore. And ultimately, it would be nice to have a unified theory for quantum pseudorandomness, similar to the success in the classical literature. And that still seems steps away, but let me just list a few immediate questions. So first of all, can we simplify our random phase state construction by using negative one instead of n root of unity? And that's actually our first attempt. It's not as easy to analyze, but we think it should work. And also, our construction of pseudorandom state relies on pseudorandom functions. How about the reverse direction? It's not clear to us you know, that's necessary. And another question is, you know, obviously, can we construct public key quantum money scheme from you know, our pseudorandom states? And finally, you know, if you can prove our candid construction of pseudorandom unitary, let me know. I'll definitely buy you a drink or anything, or anything you prefer, as long as I can pay for it using my quantum money. All right, uh, with that, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take your questions.